the shooting range. In this episode, wasps, the fearless women aviators of the United States, a gingerbread tank, and other curios. Exploring the treasures of life.worthhunter.com once again. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with the Heavy Tank T26 E1-1 Super Pershing. Many of you know or have driven the reliable Pershing, the medium tank that replaced the M4 Sherman. The Americans decided that you could never have too much of a good thing. They took the regular M26 Pershing and then upgunned it with a powerful T15 E1 cannon and increased its armor with welded on metal slabs. Yeah, the good old Pershing has changed a lot during summer. First, it got some extra layers on its mantlet. Plates were also welded to the forward hull of the tank, creating a kind of crude spaced armor. These two weird things are actually casings of the springs that help to stabilize the larger cannon. And then there is a large counterweight added to the rear of the turret bustle. Luckily, it's thick enough to serve as some extra protection for the rear side of the vehicle. All these changes made the tank much heavier, eight and a half tons heavier to be exact. That didn't improve its mobility, of course. Forget about fast maneuvers, constant flanking, or the times when you could climb a hill without much fuss. What you get in return is an excellent gun and somewhat increased survivability. Add-on armor doesn't make you invincible, of course. Far from it, your thick sloped frontal armor still can be penetrated by most guns at your BR. But the Super Pershing can certainly outlive many opponents if you play smart. Engage your targets from distance. Avoid open areas. This vehicle works especially well on urban maps or maps such as White Rock Fortress. In other words, it shines when there is sufficient cover. Once again, do not rush to join the fray. Your glacis can take some punishment, but the sides can be easily penetrated. That means that the enemy should not ever get a chance to land a shot. Move from cover to cover, make sure to check all avenues of approach. APCBC shells sure do deal a lot of damage, but it's a good idea to also have some APCRs at hand. You'll need them to deal with tougher enemies. Try to get a buddy on a fast and agile LT or MT, the T29 being our favorite pick. It will make encounters much easier and crazier for both of you. Try it out and good luck! Now, a special Pages of History in honor of the International Women's Day. When people talk about women pilots, they never fail to mention night witches, the women military aviators of the 588th Night Bomber Regiment of the Soviet Air Forces. The names of Marina Roskova and Lydia Litvak are well known to any World War II aviation buff, so we decided that it would be a bit trivial to speak about these amazing women and their adventures yet again. What we're going to do instead is to tell you all about other events of great importance that happened on the other side of the world, in the country that, much like the USSR, suddenly found itself at war with a formidable adversary. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States began to realize that even when your factories can produce aircraft at breakneck speed, you cannot do much without people to pilot them. And that was exactly the problem. There were simply not enough pilots in the Pacific. What's worse, there weren't many people who could teach new aviators. A lot of the capable flight instructors were quickly recruited for combat roles. Cultural factors didn't help either. While in the Soviet Union there was a network of state-owned aviation clubs where young men and women could learn how to fly for free, the American skies were pretty much closed for people who had no or little money. As a result, there were simply not enough people who had at least basic training in flying. In 1941, a famous racing pilot Jacqueline Cochran and the test pilot Nancy Harkness Love came to General Henry Arnold, the commander of the USA Air Force, each with her own proposal. Both women had the same thing in mind, though, the idea that the Air Forces should let women pilot combat aircraft. 
At first, both proposals were turned down. After all, this was the time when even women drivers could raise some eyebrows, let alone women aviators. But Cochrane and Loth weren't given up so easily, and after Pearl Harbor, the Air Forces changed their mind. No, women were not allowed to fight per se, but they were assigned the duty of ferrying planes from factories to airfields and military bases. But that alone was already quite an achievement. Women pilots flew all kinds of military aircraft, from the Boeing Sturman Model 75 to the fearsome Flying Fortress. They flew in all weather conditions, across all kinds of terrain, across seas and oceans, and performed the toughest aerobatic maneuvers. In other words, they were pretty badass. And even though they were still considering civilian personnel, their fame as capable pilots grew with every passing day. On August 5, 1943, the Women Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP, paramilitary organization, was born. Over 25,000 women applied, but only those who had pilot's licenses or prior experience were accepted into the WASPs, a bit more than a thousand women aviators. What came as a surprise to some was the fact that among the applicants, there were women of African American, Mexican American, Chinese American, and Native American descent. Such great proof that American melting pot was truly working, creating a society where you could get anywhere regardless of your background and the color of your skin, right? Well, not exactly. Some of these women were firmly asked to withdraw their applications, but others prevailed. Through joining the WASPs, Hazel Ying Li and Maggie G became the first Chinese-American women, and Ola Mildred Rexroth became the first Native American woman to fly with the AAF. Many pilots considered it an honor to fly to battle in an aircraft that was brought to them by one of the fiery WASP aviators. Even Disney had no qualms about giving them right to use one of their characters, a brave female gremlin, as the official WASP mascot. But the government was in no hurry to consider these women proper military pilots. Even though 38 WASP pilots lost their lives during the war, all in accidents, only in 1977, after a strong push from the public and especially veterans of the Pacific War, they were finally recognized as veterans in World War II. In 2009, the surviving members of the WASP were also awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Only fair, don't you think? After we've spoken about the gorgeous pilots of the WASP, it's only fitting for us to continue to talk about all things beautiful. Last time we showed you a selection of user-made aircraft skins. Today, we'll be talking about camouflages for ground vehicles, and oh boy, is there a lot of them. The user, called Skydread, is all for accuracy and precision. His work is a historical skin of the Ferdinand Covered, with inscriptions and drawings done in chalk by the workers who built it. There were so many little details that it took Skydread four days to make this camo. That's some dedication. Then, there's this amazing historical skin made by Commander Nomad. It's the exact copy of the T-34-1942 Leningradets from the 30th Guards Tank Brigade. The author was inspired by the photo picturing the tank advancing into Prasnyo Selo in January 1944. Looks like a fantastic winter camouflage. And now for something completely different. Have you ever wondered what a gingerbread tank would look like? Well, here you go. The player called Tiger 6 made one for you. That's one yummy piece of German engineering. Is it to your taste? Now it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answer questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. We'll hope you like it. The first question comes from a player called Copilot17. Can we expect to see Italian armor in a few years? Thanks, Gaijin. I really love your game. We'll put it this way. It's not completely out of the question, and thanks for playing our game. 
A user called Claudi Folkan has a question about engineer vehicles. Hey Gaijin, are engineer vehicles a possibility in War Thunder? I mean, lane mines, repairing other vehicles and towing the heaviest out of a ditch? No, we're not planning to add this kind of vehicles. The reason is simple, they just don't make much sense in the current version of gameplay. Mr. Bradley asks, are radars going to be implemented in the game? In other words, on Gepard or Shilka? We've got some ideas, but cannot give you an ETA just yet. Then there's a question from a player called G. Herd Fickle. Will American pilots ever get the privilege to fly the P-59 Air Comet? Yep, that's very likely to happen. Keep your eyes peeled. The last message comes from a player called Thomas Tuhey. Hello, Gaijin. Are you going to add the mighty Kugelpanzer? Yeah, sure. Right after we implement the fearsome Tsar tank. This is it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, do not forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.